Well, it's taken me years to get this far. Um, I'm skimming along in lots of things that Roy's sessions do in much, much more detail. I'm just hoping to show you just some brief ideas that you can look forward to, and if you're interested, do some more. And um, Denise was saying she wonders how to apply it to mental illness, which she's doing her PhD on. And I've suggested that we meet her and just spend an hour mm. thinking about how the basics of critical realism apply to mental illness. So mm. if anybody wants to join in with that, you know, they're welcome. Maybe we could do an applied session like that. What's your work on? <laughs> Integration and uh, intervention groups and how they impact on children. Integration? Intervention groups in social justice and how they impact Oh, on yeah, that sounds very relevant to this. Yeah. Do you go to the critical realism? No, you haven't been to the re critical realism sessions. No, I don't I'm think. From Dixie, um, you're from London Met. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, no. you're very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, um, so. Um, the other thing I'm most anxious to convey is I'm not interested in philosophy, pure philosophy. I'm just not interested in it. I'm a sociology researcher. I'm only interested in how these ideas can make my work clearer and deeper. I don't want to make it more complicated and airy-fairy. And it's called critical realism, and that's one of the reasons I really like this. Um, so... Um, if we go on through this Mel's thing, so 1M was about standing back and looking at what we're going to research. 2E was about making some intervention, maybe doing our interactive research or starting a new policy or trying to train to school, something like that. And 3L is after this very complicated activity, coming to some arrival, some new totality where people stand in different positions to each other and we understand things a bit more clearly. But not like Hegel, this is synthesis, this is the end of history. The next extra stage in critical realism is 4D, fourth dimension. And it's about having gone through the practical and the political to look in again to the inner being and to this sort of in our integrity. Are we acting as fully ourselves? not alienated, not split. So, um, and that means a new self-awareness, which we hope we'll have gained through the first three stages of MELD. And working consciously, intentionally, for real change and reflexive agency and choice. And also this idea of transformation, this is from, you know, some people say Piaget is like steps up hmm. to the next step. And you're not quite sure how you arrive at the next step unless genetics somehow unfolds a new bit of you. With critical realism, transformation and change includes emergence. And the example taken from the physical sciences is that water emerges from oxygen and hydrogen, H2O, but you can't split them back again. It's something completely new. It can't be reduced back into its original elements. Similarly, um, as persons, our brain emerges from our body, our mind from our brain, our consciousness and moral agency from our minds. Mm -hmm. And we can't collapse them back into the former. And yet, they're all held together. They're all interdependent. We can't cope without all of them together. They're all equally important in many ways. Similarly, the child emerges from the parents through the double helix and so on, but cannot be collapsed back into <coughs> the parents. And in politics, um, you have tyranny, and then at some point you have protest, and then you hope you have change, although um, the outlook for real change onto a new stage it looks very depressingly unlikely in so many countries at the moment. And it could be argued that that is because we're thinking of difference rather than transformation and change in every aspect of the personal and political of their society. Um, also that change involves becoming something new but be going. Children move into the teen years and they lose a lot of their infancy and their 
talent for learning languages quickly or making friends quickly. Um, but they gain new things, but they lose past things. Mm. Now, Mel, though, oh, um, this picture, has anyone, does anyone know it? You know the scream, I expect, mm. don't you? Um, mm. It's by the same artist, Edward Monk. Um, and it's of his 15-year-old sister dying of TB, like his mother, and the aunt looking after her. And I chose that for the cover of my book, actually, on um, children's consent surgery, because time and again, I saw the um, I saw heroic, calm child mm. um, trying to reassure parents and hide their worries from their parents, and the parents really feeling terrible mm. about putting their children through this. Um, What's the name of that painting, please? Uh, the sick child. There are two versions. That's the Norwegian one. There's one in the tape as well. And um, uh, it's just that. Um, you mentioned them. Did anyone hear the Moral Maze yesterday? You know, the Radio 4 programme. They were talking about ending life um, and whether children should be, or young people should be allowed to choose to end their lives if they were near the end of a life of great suffering. Um, and really, I think 4D is this arrival through experience, new kind of life, new kind of relationships, of, at a new sense of inner being and maturity and awareness. <clears throat> But Mel really is open-ended. So when we have arrived, say, at a new and better school or um, research, <clears throat> we, we don't really want to stop there because part of the arrival means being aware of higher standards, new opportunities, mm. further <clears throat> options. And so there's the chance of going back to begin at 1M again, stepping back, taking a look, deciding to intervene in new ways, and so on, and never coming to this kind of finite end, which would be unrealistic. There's a lot in critical realism about, about the good society, but I think the good society isn't sort of perfect heaven and utopia. I think it's um, a society that encourages protest, dissent, change, and renewal and newness, instead of punishing um, whistleblowers and uh, protesters. I don't know what your idea of the good society is. Would anybody like to say? <laughs> I suppose having the opportunity to articulate what you believe. And be. Be, yeah, do be it. who you are. Yeah. Not just say it, because that mm. would be epistemic, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah, so 4D is very much about being the author of your own life, being your full self. <clears throat> which um, critical realists argue everybody to some degree wants to be and do. Now, I thought I'd just whiz through Mel twice um, because it implies it's always benign. I think actually it, it describes the malign adverse process as well. So to take the benign one, and in the last session I mentioned the first and school strike. Do you remember the children mm. arrived at school very cold? The teachers were sacked for lighting a fire in the freezing room to dry out their wet clothes. And there was the longest strike in British history and they set up an alternative school. So one end would be the children and the staff realising that they weren't simply passively um, controlled by the managers. They had knowledge and awareness and needs and important things to do with their lives and they realized that um, back in um, before 1914 at a time when um, women's rights weren't really heard of very much apart from suffragettes um, so standing back suspending stereotypes of obedience and compliance working class children of course and then moving very bravely to second edge recognizing the absences their need and their suffering and doing something about it, um, protesting, marching around with banners, um, saying they were going to set up a new school. The third level, this new totality, they opened the school and there was a whole new community, education in the future, how it must have transformed the lives of those children who, and throughout their lives, who attended the new school on the other side of the village green. And that school went on for some years. Um, and it is likely that one reason the school survived for so long was that there was quite a lot of introspection, reflection, conscious 
thinking about yourself and your relationships with everybody and how to make the school work really well before D. And probably saying, oh, well, let's start this new thing and so on. Um, there's some, there's, have you, any of you looked at the archive section in the library here? That some um, schools have um, put their records there. Some of the private schools run by families with their photographs and uh, all their records and diaries and so on. Um, and there's lovely photographs of uh, children at one school digging their swimming pool and then splashing in it. Mm -hmm. Just wouldn't be allowed today, would it? Mm -hmm. A council with the children sitting around um, deciding school policy and what to do, and the teachers silently sitting along the sides. And th there was very um, interesting differences of power and sharing of power in some of these schools. So this is the kind of meld as the benign process, but I suggest that a lot of the impetus of meld, once you've stepped on to 1M and then to 2E, you can't help pushing forward to 3L and 4D. And it doesn't always go well. So with a failing school, just imagine that everyone goes on assuming the st stereotypes, the bad children, the poor results, the uh, inefficient head. And instead of labelling people as failures, a whole school bad. <clears throat> so then that moves on to second ed. And there's a missing of the real absences and the needs and contradictions. Just an emphasis on the failures and trying to remove them and replace them with somebody different, imposing difference, closing a school but then reopening much the same one. At 3L, there's um, the idea of, oh, well, we've changed the school now. <laughs> That's it. We can expect good results. And yet there hasn't been difference as deep change and transformation. And so there remain splits, detotalizing. Uh, the staff may not be a united team. Uh, they may not have loyalty to the new important superhead. Uh, there might be, some of the problems might be even more um, serious or glossed over. And that leads in, if that's happening, in the fourth dimension, these glossing over the cracks, covering the cracks, blocks self-awareness um, and the shared consciousness of working for change. It increases power too, an insistence that everybody complies with the new regime. But that can mean that people are alienated from one another and from their true selves. It can ignore the mind-body dualism. And my colleague Barry Mayo has done quite a lot of work on how schools tend to ignore children's bodies, their needs for exercise, just moving around, water during the day, uh, proper washing and toilets, all sorts of things in which schools tend to, when they say child-centred, really mean mind-centred rather than body-centred. So, and that can alienate people, particularly the more restless ones. Um, and so it ignores also the critical realism ideas of natural necessity, human need for freedom and justice and solidarity. And there's a contradiction in oppressive schools because real education is about challenging, questioning, changing. But if at the same time you've got a lot of control and suppression, you're discouraging that. And the contradictions which MELD aims to analyse and resolve can worsen in these kind of ways. But once you've got down to 3L, 4D is pretty inevitable, unless at some stage you go back to 1M and take a really serious look at the deeper problems and possibilities, the absences and potential. So how do you do that? How do you... How do you really think? You're saying you can miss the reality, so how you know, do you actually uh, not miss the reality? Yes. How do you do that? How do you not miss the reality? I, you take reality. Well, how do you know what to do? Yeah, well, for one thing in research, you take reality seriously. Things are real, it's not just all, all ideas and claims. And um, as I said it very, very briefly in this first book, it all began with the children being cold and wet 
and the teachers being concerned for them. And lots of people wouldn't think of a school and education and the teacher-child relationship looking at whether children are dry or cold and wet or not. Mm -hmm. But that is the real going on. And you can't learn if you're shivering with cold and maybe fever. Um, people are arguing at the moment that it's hard for children to learn if they haven't enough to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's the, the realism of bodies and the mind and body dialectic that we, if we want to attend to children's minds, we have to attend to children's bodies as well alongside that and listen to the children for their experience. Go right back to basics in a way and question the most basic assumptions. So for failing schools, you would just find out more about children experiencing. Oh yes, and why are they failing? Failure. Yeah, a lot of it is blaming families, isn't it? But yeah. then, well, they're not in the school. And very often the children arrive at five, eager to learn, mm. uh, having learnt a language, all sorts of things, all the basics, as Hard Gardener has pointed mm. out, in a, just a few years. And then, suddenly, many of them become mm -hmm. disaffected. Why? Mm. That's the big question, isn't it? So why do they always come back to the fact that they actually, you know, not learning well enough or how do they meet the reality then? How do they meet the reality who all the time? They? Well, well, okay. uh, well I take um, Michael Gove as somebody who really misses reality. He's not interested in reality. He's interested mm -hmm. in solutions, which is fair enough. But that means jumping to 3L. Whereas the first thing you've got to do is say, what are the problems? What are the contradictions? Why are things going wrong? And then you've got to look at um, 2E, you know, how do we intervene in order to transform and change rather than make things different? Mm -hmm. I was thinking when you said in the, the four, 4D in the other slide, you were saying about um, the contradiction with education and oppression. Yeah. And I was thinking the exam system completely is an example of that. Yes. Because it's all about convergence. And then I remember reading that when children were analysed in terms of divergent or convergent thinking when they came into school, something like, I'm, I'm just saying this, 90% were divergent thinkers. Basically they thought in, you know, independently and creatively. And by the time they finished at the end of primary school, it was something like 20% of the more divergent thinkers. So basically what the school system had done was get them all conforming and converging. Mm. And then when it comes to like A-levels, I mean, when I did A-levels centuries ago, you could actually use your own, you know, you could put forward your own argument. Now it's all completely tick this objective and mark that, you yeah. know, it has to be completely what they want. Now you could argue that one great reason for this is economics, that it's cheaper to mark multiple choice mm. and it seems fairer and the less arguments about it, so you can teach to the test and so on. And that economics is more and more and more driving education through evaluation, cost effective, um, have we got the right outcomes, are these students going to turn out to be high earning adults and so on. Um, as if the school is really like the universities are supposed to be, the, the generators of the nation's wealth. Economically speaking, well, they will be, but they're also generators of the nation's wealth in many other ideas that might be been rather uh, neglected for the sake of um, economic arguments. So if we look at natural necessity, the actual empirical and the changes in exams and curricula and teaching methods and so on, underneath a great causal mechanism and factor for change is economics. Yeah. Isn't it the whole thing too about applying business models which yeah. came in with Taylorism when he talked about time and motion studies mm. and applying them to health and education mm. but the difference is we're dealing with people here mm. and not factories and machines. You know. Another thing is to um, blame the failures on the failures the opt-outs, the truants and so on, rather than thinking well, if schools were, um, instead of being compulsory, and, that, and the last government actually made it a crime to truant, didn't they? It hadn't been a crime before. Your parents can go to prison now. Um, if instead schools were voluntary, um, 
the chances are that nearly everybody would want to go because schools would have to change in order to attract people to come. Mm. And anyway, lots of young people go because they see their friends there and so on. They don't, they don't just go for the lessons. Mm. But the idea of voluntariness means... I, I, I started as a school teacher and the saddest thing is when one person in the class doesn't want to be there and makes it very difficult for everybody else. Whereas if you could have make sure that, with, like here, on the whole, the lessons, the classes, the sessions are for people who've chosen to come. And it's, there's all the difference in the world between teaching the people who want to be there. That's part of 4D as well. It's your real true self and being the author of your lives. So what did, what did they decide not to come, not to attend school? Yeah, well, um, I was in such an interesting meeting. Um, you know about the Compass Group, do you? It's a sort of semi-political group. Anyway, they had a, a day on the Good Society with hundreds of people there, and we were all in small groups. <laughs> and um, one rather laid-back man um, had come from Brighton, and he said he ran um, a... Co they called it a college, so they didn't have to be a school uh, with all the Ofsted thing, but it was a school, really. But it was a free school, and the students could come along and do what they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And a former director of here, the Institute of Education, was sitting next to me, and he said, oh, but what happens when they refuse to do maths? And the man smiled. I knew what he was going to say. They all do maths, because it's based on IT and personal programs, and they all love maths. And little children love maths, yes. don't they, when they get computer oh. games and so on. So it's just following the child's interests and talents all, all the way up, rather than assuming top down. But if they don't find any interest in school? Sorry? If they don't find any interest in school? Well, little children love, love learning. They're sponges, aren't they? Yeah. Of what you kind of so talk what about goes wrong? Well, I'm thinking about this because my daughter doesn't want to go to school. Well, <laughs> what's wrong with the school? Well, what's wrong with the school? Because I bet your daughter is keen to well, learn lots of things. Me. Yes, exactly. She's it's probably cool. a long yeah. day for a start. But don't you find she loves learning? Yeah, yeah so. exactly. I think I, I um, teach music to a girl who's homeschooled, and she's yeah. the most intrinsically motivated person I've ever met. She's up at a quarter to seven to start music practice because she's got such a busy day, including loads of things like climbing, sailing in, in, in the evening. And she is just soaring. Yeah. And so because she's had no constraints, of, you know, she's just followed what she wanted to do, and her mum's more or less let her do that. Obviously, it's a privileged family. That's what I was thinking, because practically, that, that's very difficult to do. But then if schools were like that... Um, yeah. Actually, um, it's just been issued by Routledge, but I was writing residence in another school where just before um, they brought in all the literacy arms and stuff, um, from the three-year-olds in the nursery up to the 11-year-olds, Everyone had a little book with ten things to do each day. Maths, writing, creativity, mm. science and so on. And um, they chose the order they'd do it. They walked to the room, they, they did the thing, the teacher ticked off the task and then they went and chose the next one. Everyone organised their day. They're quite capable of doing that. Mm. Choice is a big thing in intrinsic motivation. Yeah. I've just mm. been writing about it. <laughs> and of course it increases the quality of the education that the teachers are able to offer because it's informed by the people who are, are doing the learning mm -hmm. with, through this interaction. Really, dialectic is um, a word for interaction, I think, really, isn't it? Um, so, shall I just do my conclusion and then we'll do some discussion. There are quite a lot of things I think critical realism is introducing, which um, other uh, theories of research are not so strong on. <clears throat> so it wants to move beyond abstract philosophy, Kantian and Platonic um, ethics, <clears throat> and to think that ethics are real, justice is real, we deeply feel it and know it and do it. Um, it's an invisible causal power, it's a mechanism for change. And like gravity, we can't see justice, but we can see it in its effects. Mm. Things fall, or there are law courts. <clears throat> People's motives and hopes and reasons for action 
are embodied in their human nature and relationships. They're not just in our minds. Our bodies are essential in ethics. Um, for example, there is some um, public protest and dissent and solidarity. And one thing that at least makes gov governments change a bit is the presence of mass bodies on the streets. You know, that does achieve some kind of change in direction. <clears throat> There's also, they express solidarity, and the um, young people in the squares who say, we will die for our rights. Well, if they're going to die, it means I'm going to die for other people's rights. That is the extreme solidarity, isn't it? But it's an embodied um, intention and action. Um, ethics also exists in social and political structures of justice and injustice and as we were saying about schools and whether schools can be free and creative or less so it's partly the economic and the political structures in which they exist mm. and the demands made on them so ethics also is real at structural level um, and beyond fake utopi utopianism the idea of it would be nice to have that society, but it will never be true. Um, critical realism is interested in the practical working towards the society when um, the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. So that um, it's the idea that no one can really flourish at the cost of someone else's suffering, slavery, exploitation. You know, Our real flourishing can only really happen when... Um, Everyone can share it. Well, that will never happen, mm. but it's something to think about and work towards through these male cycles. Um, also, ethics is about needing research to analyse and collect, connect all of these levels. And also through all the processes of research, aims, methods, topics, um, relationships between research teams and with the people we research and processes. In, at the end of it, I put, um, oh, things to discuss. I don't know if you'd like to um, work through a meld program or something like that. Um, I did make a list of these ideas of seven forms of freedom, which I mentioned last time, which link together all the different ideas and connect them, rather than think that they're contradictory. And there's the references. Um, so, I'm not sure what you'd like to do for the last half hour. What? Apart from you can go home early if you like. <laughs> can I ask a question? You, you talked about melt cycle and you started um, explaining questions you can, you can uh, well, address to each. Yes. Uh, so, in, yes. for the M, um, you mentioned what are the problems or contradictions. Yes. And for the uh, two uh, edges, uh, how do we intervene? So, can you. Uh, yeah, and I've said to, to, yeah, can yes. you just mention what are the questions for the remaining two? You can like what are what questions could you po ask or raise for for the next two stages? What three L and four D? Four, yes. Mm -hmm. um, three L. Um, <coughs> I did rather skip over those because um, instead of going through the critical realism concepts, I'd rather put them into. 1M and 2E. Um, but actually those concepts do apply to the later ones as well, trying to avoid the epistemic fallacy mm -hmm. and think about the semiotic triangle and the real and this kind of things also apply at 4E and um, 3L and 4E, 4D. Um, so part of the question is um, how can we understand the new emerging totalities and their relationships and their interactions and how they have changed, transformed, emerged from the former, mm -hmm. less satisfactory state. And also how far have we um, achieved whatever we were trying to work towards? Mm -hmm. What sort of problems and contradictions have we from one end, have we tried to resolve? How far have we achieved that? How far is there still to go? Mm -hmm. And then 4D, <coughs> oh, another is um, how far have we sort of improved a general state of affairs, laws, um, 
the design and running of a school and so on to benefit everyone, but also taking account of the individual person concerned as well. The very difficult balance between the collective and the individual good. And yet you can't have the collective good without attention to the individual good. And individuals alone can't be happy unless there's a solidarity and a group well-being as well. How, how in that particular school, hospital, community can that be worked towards? And then 4D is, um, oh, and that's thinking about these different questions, problems, entities, ethical principles, goals, systems, methods, how they fit together and interact together in these constellations. And 4D is about how, how, what have we learned? How have we changed? How much is this reflecting our real hopes and wishes and potential? Um, how has, have things, how have we emerged as a group and individually into a, a new form relationship? I don't know if you want to um, sort of say take mental illness for example and, and work through a meld that would be incredibly helpful for me <laughs> given well, that I have no idea <laughs> should we have a, a is, are people happy <clears throat> about doing mental illness or would you rather do something else or? right um, have I got this little list somewhere of um, um, four meld things I think I've put them in. Um, can you? Do you know which slide they were on? Um, oh yes, it's on slide twelve. Yes. Right. So, um, first movement. Um, shall we take the example of um, young black men in Camberwell? on drugs, uh, drop out from school, can't get employment, uh, sometimes in gangs or sometimes outside gangs and worried about how many people use with that, um, having difficult, painful family relationships and relationships with um, partners, maybe they have children of their own. Um, not all that much. Um, to do, not much money, mm. and not much space. I was amazed. Um, you know Camilla Batmangela, who runs mm. the kids' skate? Well, she was talking about the streets of Camberwell. I've lived and been around there for many years, and I just didn't recognise them. She was talking about how terribly, terribly dangerous the streets of Camberwell are. Well, it, I never felt they were at all dangerous. And I realised that actually the maps of um, areas of London are psychologically completely different depending on who you are what your relationships are with people around there some of the young people she's talking about they don't walk down the street because they're so worried that somebody's going to attack them or drag mm -hmm. them into an empty building but things that are quite invisible to many of us walking around so mm -hmm. at first I could hardly believe it and then I thought yes I'm, I'm sure she's completely right a lot of it isn't just in our heads so it is there but mm -hmm. it's in our social relationships, our position in society, the sort of safety and security we have or do not have. So, um, I haven't mentioned mental illness yet, but <laughs> trying to look at contradictions and difficulties that set this up. And also in Camberwell, as I expect, you know, the um, sort of world-leading um, mental hospital is there, the Maudsley mm. and the Psych yeah. it's in Institute of Psychiatry. And so there's very high powered services there, mm. but there's a very high incidence of um, mental ill health there as well. Um, would you add anything else for one M if you were thinking about this particular group and their mental health? Housing I haven't really mentioned. Systemic racism? Racism. racism, yeah. Police, stop and search. Um, 
school. History school. of schools. History of uh, colonial relations between Britain and Africa, Caribbean. Yes, um, not only and um, immigration and migration. People over for the low paid work and then saying, well, go home if we can't employ you. <coughs> but also, um, you could say the um, Bonnie Greer was on the radio yesterday. Did you hear her? <laughs> uh, talking about the history of slavery and uh, she was a New Yorker who a very famous art now <laughs> writer I and that after the narrow maze last night. Yes. Oh was it last night? Yeah. yeah. And um she was just saying that three of them with um Scottish names like McGregor and Greer, mm -hmm. um as um in their early twenties for the first time came over from New York to Scotland and were telling people we have come for our inheritance. Because of course they, they had Scottish forebears of some description who were the slave owners, uh -huh. and people just couldn't understand what they meant. But uh -huh. white Americans come back to look at their inheritance in Scotland, don't they? Uh -huh. And they were making the point it was theirs as well, and and they're living with this um, heritage and history. And of course, one M is a lot about the past, past structures, oppressions, um really kind of grooves that we're fixed into very deeply and are hard to get out of. Any other difficulties that you could think about? Low expectations in terms of employment yeah. and social mobility. Yeah. Oh, um, there was an interview with the man who directed 12 Years a Slave. Did any of you see it? I've seen the film, but no, yeah, yeah. the interview yeah. was that um, he was put. He couldn't. He had a patch of his eye, I think, with glasses, and he was put in the remedial class and written off. Oh. And he was in the interview. He was saying things like, "Fuck them," you know. But my school tried to destroy me, and and he's won an Oscar. Oh. <laughs> Steve McQueen. Yeah. That was his name. Yeah. So really, this is rather sociological because we're talking about all the social, economic and political aspects of mental illness, but we need to talk about, I think, the impact of drugs and do you think how important you think genetics, diet, drink, physical things <coughs> are? That would be in one end, we'll consider that. Sorry? So you would consider genetics? Um, in one end. Oh, definitely. Um, because they are the contradictions and difficulties that we're beginning from. And we have to look at bodies and being and doing as well as thinking and minds. Yeah, but their appearance is body too. Hmm? Their appearance. Appearance, yes. So the fact that, you know, they, their, their skin colour or, you know, Yes, yes. Yeah. Also, also your also. dress, whether you've got tattoos, yeah. whether you wear jewellery, can be a plus or a minus depending on what it's like and who you are. I think there's all kinds of ideas about what's constituted as normal or normal mm -hmm. behaviour, mm -hmm. right? So yes. I think when you think about young children, I won't know more about young children experiences but the way young children are pathologized if they are like your, your example of being active in class that that's seen as a behavioral problem yeah. rather mm -hmm. than just I happen to be an active person or yes. you know like to move my body around they so should be it's seen about and not heard. yeah mm -hmm. yeah particular ideas about what's constituted as normal behavior and then what's constituted as deviant which I think mm -hmm. happens a lot yes. with mental health doesn't it and that's yeah. so much to do with space because um, we talk about young people hanging around on the street corners as if they shouldn't have any impulse to go out and meet and enjoy company they should be mm -hmm. where well where should they be because the homes are smaller and smaller they often haven't got gardens. Mm -hmm. um, they have, may not have space to invite their friends around at home. And yet we can't be bothered to provide civilised spaces for them to meet in and um, enjoy society and be part of it. That's a really big thing. I mean, I knew when we were living in Whitechapel, all the Bengali families, there were just so many, 
in a, a household, it meant that the young people all had to hang out. So when my boys would have been playing in the street with them when they were young, but as they became teenagers, there was more of a separation because my boys had room to do things and have their friends in the house, mm. whereas none of them could because there was just loads of kids. Yes. And um, so there was a big parting of the ways there, mm. and it was just, I thought, my goodness, where are they supposed to go? Yeah. Another thing is that um, the um, swimming pools and libraries and so on, um, well, quite, quite a lot of swimming pools and have been privatised as le leisure centres mm -hmm. and private. London's quite good for um, places to meet, like libraries and swimming pools, but lots of places in the country are not or are closing. Mm -hmm. And that again shuts down on social space. And if you're not in the social space where you're meant to be, sort of by definition, you're deviant, you're in the wrong place. But then if there isn't a place for you to be in, by definition, you're also in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. I also think it's very difficult when you have different cultural norms at home and when you're outside and you have to sort of try and make sense of what's happening in the legal shape there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of one end, sort of linking together the physical, the mental distress, um, and uh, the political and economic structures and relationships, you know. So then 2E is then, depending on what you've thought about in one end, what you've looked at, what you've excluded, and what you've taken very seriously, your 2E intervention will be about trying to resolve contradictions, absent these absences and difficulties, and achieve um, a better life for people. So one way, of course, is medication, therapy, counselling, mentoring, but um, is that enough? Or is it a way of making people um, tolerate political and economic difficulties more quietly? Hmm. Would you say psychotropic drugs are the modern street jacket, don't they? Well, you could say that for a lot of um, use of Ritalin, for example. For, yeah. Mm, not completely, but for a great many people who are supposed to be rep hyperactive, it's really a very relative idea. Um, it's very useful to be active and full of energy in lots of contexts, but not if you're supposed to sit in the classroom all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it fits in with what you were saying, because I, I certainly feel boys are, I mean, this is only my personal opinion, I think schools are very feminised, having had two boys myself, and I know how physical they are, and a lot of primary school, you know, sit down all the time, mm -hmm. there's not enough emphasis on the body, whereas my deep psychological theory with children, with boys, was treat them like dogs, they need exercise every day. And then, because they got so much exercise, then they could really engage. But the problem is with school is that doesn't happen. Yeah, and they're selling off playgrounds, yeah. restricting sport. I mean, even when they go swimming, they spend an awful lot of time just sitting on the edge and then having a short term themselves. Oh. It's not really exercise, it's not really fun, is it? It's all turned into a, oh. a mechanical pedagogy. So there's some irony, I think, that boys are socialized to be active. I might disagree with some of your uh, rooting that it gender in the biology there, but that boys are socialized, part of boyness is socialized to, to be a very active, macho kind of idea of interacting with the world, and yet then they're punished at the same time in particular social situations. Actually, I, I personally think all kids should have loads of physical exercise. Yeah, I would be I more inclined. I think all people should yeah, be able to move. You know, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Another thing I've rather glossed over is we could be looking at the different um, experience of young men and young women with mm. mental health problems, couldn't we? Yeah. So would you also look at how, the sort of things you were talking about, low expectations and how to sort of a, how to find them in some sort of a, a Space where they're comfortable in, in society, or you know how to do, uh, how to make this happen. Would you go that far as to look at barriers in any society that keep them from, you know? Yes, including the contradictions of assumptions, stereotypes, traditions, 
the powerful people saying, we haven't got the money for that. No, there's no evidence and proof that what you're saying will have better outcomes. All of this debate is the um, difficulties to address in 2E. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. the resident just, you know, uh, uh, giving them medicine. Um, doing some sort of a, a therapeutic work. Yes. Um, maybe there's also some more to do in terms of a, Yeah, they they have aspirations and, and I don't know, trying to sort of make this happen. Yeah, no, that's definitely something that I'm looking into because I know it's, I teach a group of adults who've got mental health problems and, um, you know, with the government push about getting people into jobs, they're often just encouraged to go to some kind of very low paid job that yeah. none of us would want to stay in exactly. but it's almost as if nobody asked them actually what do you aspire to mm -hmm. um, and but there's the structural agency thing because obviously there's more and more cuts and there was a big thing in the Guardian yesterday about the cuts to the mental health service and so even if they have got the agency where they do want to really improve mm -hmm. and maybe join a new class or whatever the structures are that the money's being withdrawn from mental health things. Mm. It looks as if um, Kidscape has got useful practical answers. They run a lot of mm. art, music, mm. um, activities, have a lot of mentoring, social support, solidarity going on. Um, did any of you go to the exhibition by Kidscape at the Tate Gallery a few years ago? It had six cabins outside the Tate, and one of them um, was. Um, it was a very, very spooky pink girl's bedroom with a sort of great shadow on it of the of a paedophile. Uh, it were, I'll never forget it. It was amazing art about um, the difficulties in their lives and how they were overcoming that. Mm -hmm. And in 2E, when thinking about interventions and change, working with the young people concerned, trying out things, stopping things if they don't seem to work or change, but looking for transformation and change, not only of the young people, but of the circumstances as well. Mm. Mm. So that would leave you, 3L, you hope, to a new kind of local neighbourhood, perhaps, with the um, CAMS, the ch children and adolescents mm. mental health teams involved but just not stopping there, you, involving lots of other people as well. Yeah, because actually you'd have to change, because there's a big stigma, and you'd have to change the people with whom they interact if you actually really want to make something, yes. make a difference. Exactly, because even if you had drugs that made the, um, some of the young people behave perfectly and responsibly, it'll be, they may, might still have many stigma, prejudice, discrimination still to overcome. Yeah. And then 4D is when you hope that you have reached a new level of some kind is to have a lot of thinking about how the change has been achieved, how it's changed each one of us, our relationships, our values, our attitudes. Do we have higher aspirations and want to start again in a new way. Uh, are some of the young people really fed up with all the 2E and 3L interrupt interventions and just think it's a waste of time? How, how to listen to them and learn from them, engage more with them? I don't know if you agree with this. If, if you think it's too idealistic or it's not practical, and would you... Um, take another tack to, this is kind of intervention research, isn't it? I mean, is there another, another way you do it? Punishment? Oh. So are you proposing this as a research, as a, as a methodological tool, as an analytic tool or are yeah. you proposing it as the way things happen in the world? I'm not, I feel like we're sort of moving between the yeah, three. Yeah, thanks for s saying that and stitching the beginning to the end, Rachel, because um, I said at the beginning that um, we did the ten topics from first plans to dissemination. Funders and researchers concentrate nearly all on the, the middle topics. They, um, they don't in 
they rarely have the funds and time to involve people that they're going to do research with in planning the work. They have to plan it all before they get funding on the whole. Mm. Then they go out and collect their data, analyse their data, write their report, and then move on to the next project. But, of course, if research is going to be useful, we have to go through the final stages of um, explaining it to practitioners and policy makers, mm -hmm. working with them on change, mm -hmm. and involving people who use services, children, young people, people with mental health, so that research will be seen much more as part of um, a moral society. And uh, when it is just the data analysis and reporting, that really is the epistemic fallacy. We collapse all the life that we have observed and recorded into data, into transcripts and reports and statistics and computers spreadsheets and a report in a journal maybe a book maybe a review of a book and that's it that's all words and thinking we've, re we've shriveled research into the epistemic fallacy mm. whereas we need to restore it back into ontology being and doing as well and think really hard about you know, why are we doing this project not just to get money <laughs> You know, is it really need? How is it? Will it be most useful? Right through to the end of working with the people concerned on using any knowledge that we've managed to contribute. So that'd be a completely different way of looking at research and of funding, and of politicians' use of research, which is they just pick the ones that suit them and mm. it, and rubbish the rest, don't they? Well, it's nearly half past. Um, thank you for staying all the time. I thought you might leave at seven. <laughs> and um, you. did you have anything you wanted to add? Or? Could you just tell me what praxis means? Practical action <clears throat> is the Marxist idea. <clears throat> really, what I've just been saying, you don't just stop at oh. your report. You do something. OK. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. That was really helpful.